here we are again in Bakewell Parish Church for another conversation with John Butler. John, today's topic is very close to home for me. Um, uh, recently, I lost uh, my lovely niece um, uh, to um, suicide. She took, chose to take her own life. And uh, this weekend, uh, her ashes were scattered in a ceremony with her family. It's, uh, uh, it's tragically common amongst young people especially, actually especially young men uh, between the ages of 19 and 25, uh, suicide is now the biggest killer. Uh, more than drugs, alcohol, guns, fast cars. Um, so th so the, the biggest danger, the biggest killer is, is this, the mind and what it tells us. And I know we both have some modest experience of depression from time to time. Uh, and a large part of our audience, a, a significant number, are young people. And I thought we could uh, explore this topic together and see what, uh, not comfort, comfort's not particularly the right word, but what insight the, your practice of meditation over many years can bring to this topic when somebody chooses to end the life. My mind goes back to <clears throat> some years ago, standing beside a coffin, looking down at a young man, well known and dear to me, still wearing his jeans and his trainers, and his poor mother, at that time my closest friend, distraught beside herself, beside me. Why? 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 I don't know that I can point to it as a definite factor, but he'd recently told me he'd been on a meditation retreat where He'd been left on his own to practice hour after hour after hour, I think almost all day, I'm not sure about the night. And of course being young and inexperienced he hadn't had the breakthrough that he had hoped for and so he became depressed. It led to him feeling he was a failure. It was certainly when I heard about it, I was, I was very upset and cross that, that any organisation should leave such a vulnerable young man in that position. And it's something I've, that I took deeply into myself and have always been conscious of when people come to me to learn to meditate. It's strong medicine and it needs uh, careful guidance, at least in the early stages. Why, why, why? Well, I can remember standing by the parapet of Bakewell Bridge, just down the hill from here myself, as a young man at that age. I wasn't far from it then. And on a few other occasions. can get pretty awful, can't it? And in particular when we feel we're at odds with the world around us, that nobody understands us, we're alone. There seems no other option. Of course not everyone feels that deeply, and part of me can 
find admiration for those that feel so deeply that they find themselves in this situation. It's, you could say it's, the, it's indicative of a great soul that they should so feel. And of course, when we begin questioning, asking the big questions about life, what's it for? When you start looking at the world of man and saying, feeling, thinking to yourself, this is wrong, this is not it, this is not how I want to be, we do. The deep questions get us into deep water. And, uh, big waves and we don't always know, we're not always able to, how to cope with it. I think life gets on top of us. Yet some of us just have to ask these questions. And perhaps because <coughs> so many people don't or somehow sidestep them or reach a compromise or follow the path of eat, drink and be merry, we feel ever more isolated. Nobody understands me. That's the cry, isn't it? Nobody wants me. If I have anything of an answer, it's taken me a long life to find it. But that's not much comfort, is it, to a young man? You want the answer there and then. Well, we get partial answers, partial comforts. Little bits. What can we say or do? I think back to that incident with the young man and his mother. As far as I remember, we just stood in silence. Afterwards, sometime afterwards, she went on to found one of these 
voluntary organizations that uh, offer support to uh, to uh, both the uh, young people and the parents uh, in this situation. And I suppose I pursued ever further and deeper the, what I do, the practice of meditation. Ever seeking for that deeper meaning which, alas, eluded him. Perhaps, John, I, I ought to uh, issue some sort of public health warning uh, you get it on the side of packets of cigarettes, <laughs> government health warning, smoking can seriously damage your health. Should we do the same with meditation practice? Well, <laughs> well, Phil, you, you ask the question with a smile, but actually it's dead serious. And um, I was taught fortunately in a school where guidance was taken very seriously and we were strongly, uh, very strongly advised to keep in touch with the school regularly and attend. Um, meditation takes us into unknown territory and um, People vary very much in how they take it, and for some people it's it's quite frightening to step into the unknown, experience space, perhaps for the first time. Not everybody's accustomed to it. And guidance, perhaps even more than guiding is very often just reassurance. It's just the comfort of a, someone with more experience who can assure you that it's okay. Perhaps explain a bit. I was very strongly advised uh, so much and no more. Um, I think if, if school had even guess that I would have did, done what this young man did, he would have been horrified. No way would it have allowed it. Uh, I must present, however, the, uh, uh, the other side of this coin. And in a recent retreat um, uh, where we spent uh, twice a day in meditation in this church with a group of people from all over the world, uh, one of the uh, things said in our after breakfast conversation with you is that um, none of us had ever been harmed by our practice of meditation. And you were very clear and strong about this yourself in your own practice. You, you were, correct me if I'm wrong, you said you'd never had a harmful meditation. Well, yes, uh, indeed. I personally have never had a a frightening or unpleasant experience in all my long life of meditation. But that doesn't mean to say that there isn't the odd exception. And it's that exception, of course, which um, which uh, which uh, leads to caution. Um, for most people, thank God, uh, it's not, it's, uh, it's perhaps not needed. But uh, you never know, do you? You never know until you set out on this way how you're going to take it. Um, little and often was, well, little and regularly, twice a day. It was only a quarter of an hour that I started with, uh, morning and evening, and after quite several months it was extended to, to uh, I think the best part of a year before I got on to half an hour. And half an hour was considered sufficient, quite sufficient. Half an hour, twice a day. 
course I do more now, but it's I'm an old man after it's become my main work. That's suicide. Because in a way, meditation is a sort of suicide. In fact, think back, Jesus tells us to die to this world, doesn't he? And indeed, that is what we may later call the work, is to do this, to let go worldly, our attachments to the world, which is in fact a sort of dying. The letting go. Yes, I've often thought of meditation as a as a sort of a preliminary to death, the practice of, of dying. And dying, I suppose that's why I'm so convinced that that dying is a opening to freedom, is a going home, because that's exactly what meditation teaches you. It's not the end but the beginning. And there's nothing to fear whatsoever. Um, yes, uh, except ye die to the world, says Jesus, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, it couldn't be plainer than that, could it? <laughs> well, if you take that literally, <laughs> well. Uh, I was surprised to uh, encounter a meditation, a prescribed meditation when I was in India at uh, an ashram in uh, Tiruvannamalai and um, apparently it's it's part of the practice of several um, traditions is to meditate on your own death. It's part of the Ramana Maharshi um, passed on story that as a young man he was uh, in his uncle's house and he uh, was in, in fact, meditating on his own death when he had this, let's call self-realisation experience. So there's some overlap here, John. There is some overlap, but, um, but uh, I hope our, our listeners won't get uh, too confused about this. There's a big difference between letting your life, laying your life aside for a while um, to discover the freedom and uh, ending it for good. Because you see, the work doesn't stop there. Laying aside, I'll use the word letting go in the sense of laying aside one's life and opening up to the infinite freedom and providence of spirit is but a first step because we then need to think of other people and how to share this benefit with others, how to be of service. So to just uh, say, oh well, bother that, I'm off. It's, it's really only a very incomplete and immature procedure really compared to uh, the greater work that awaits us in, uh, in, uh, in all that's meant by spiritual development, spiritual work, not only for ourselves but for others, for the whole world. Last week we talked of the, uh, of the apparent dying of the world around us ecological disaster and indeed the whole question of human illness, disease and conversely health. What is it that goes so wrong? Mentally, physically, not only in ourselves, but in the world around us. And time and again in these videos, we've come back to consider what happens when we lose contact 
with the infinite providence and goodness that is present here now. The presence of God. Which among other things is infinitely comforting and reassuring. Which is just what in times of suicidal despair we lose touch with. The sense that we are held in the everlasting arms the end of our loneliness, the end of all our problems, really, the deeper we go into it. If we but knew this <coughs> a bit more deeply when we were younger, but we don't. It's a, it's a lifelong work. And along the way we have to learn many lessons, some of them very hard, most of them we can cope with, but apparently some of them we can't. It seems so simple to me now, this on the one hand is total abundance, total well-being in every way, in every conceivable way. It's home, it's where we belong, it's all that the world isn't. And on the other, we just have one story after another of human inability to cope. Poverty of body, mind and spirit. Confusion. And arising from confusion and of course fear, fear which gives rise to all the various aggressions of life because we're insecure, we're frightened, because we've lost our home, we've lost the comfort of our Heavenly Father. And even worse for so many people these days living in cities, we've lost not only our, our Heavenly Father, but our Mother Earth. Awful how once we lose that sense of our feet on the ground, how we just go into the never-never land of ever greater confusion, more and more of less and less. Into the bottomless pit of despair. No wonder we can hardly bear to contemplate it. I mean, it gets so awful we just throw ourselves off the bridge and Thank God most of us seem to manage to somehow struggle on. <laughs> You're not alone, John. I too have uh, stood on the bridge, in my case, over the Danube and, and done a should I, shan't I little dance. Uh, not seriously contemplating, it just seemed an option, but just it might be helpful if if you can recall your parapet experience, what, was there something that helped you from, you, you were, a, you were a, a, a meditator from the age of 26, I don't know how old you were it, in this experience you're referring to, or subsequent experiences. Once you'd started um, meditation practice, can you recall anything that went on in your thinking at the time when you were got so close to the edge? Well, this particular incident was before I started to meditate. I don't clearly remember I think I was recently back from one of my great journeys. I went to Australia as a young man when I was 20. 
when I was in South America uh, and coming home after after those great experiences was terribly difficult to adjust. Um, yes, strangely enough, I don't remember exactly when it was or what stopped me doing it. Maybe I thought of my mother back home. Perhaps that was it. I think, as far as I remember, actually, uh, it seems a dreadful thing to have done at the time, but I think in my despair I must have said, no, oh, I don't suppose I said it, I must have cried out to my mother, I'm going to kill myself, and it, and it rushed out and banged and slammed the door behind me, but maybe something of me remembered the, the uh, aghast look on her face and something like that, I can't just remember. Maybe something of that penetrated that, because strangely enough, that sort of Despair can be terribly selfish, can't it? It's totally centred on me. You just don't see anything but me, poor me, and my my this, this all-consuming loneliness that just cuts you off from everything and everybody. And uh, maybe something of my mother came into that and just gave me that moment of step back. I, for me, often, yes, just the, the factor of going outside, of getting out of the house, because so often these, this build-up of despair would occur with other people. Often, a, in my case, even a family situation, when I just sort of felt the pressure of... I just had to, like an explosion, you know, just to get out of it. And just going out, because it was in, in, at night, in the evening, and the quiet water and the cool night air must have uh, soothed me, thank God. I've always thought of those things as angels, by the way, you know, the nature, these elemental aspects of nature. On countless occasions they've helped, uh, helped me back to sanity. Still, the fact is, for some people it happens. Is it a solution? I remember after this incident I told you about, I think, one of, of course, everybody wrote sympathetic letters, and I think one of them said something about uh, it was a, a permanent situation for a temporary dis depression. That was the tragedy of it. It was a you know, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. <laughs> of course, the depression doesn't seem like a nut at the time. It seems uh, it seems total, doesn't it? But all the same, it's uh, such an extreme solution. And does it solve it anyway? Because, of course, what happens after death? What do we carry with us beyond the grave? This is another of those great unanswered questions which one may perhaps uh, acquire some light on as one goes through life, but one's never really quite sure. But what has he got to face the other side? Quite apart from leaving his mother in despair. You say that uh, a focus of attention is on of course, your own despair or your own darkness or whatever. Whatever we don't know what it's like to be somebody else. We don't. We can't step into somebody else's mind. We don't. We we can only conjecture. But it does seem to be a closed space. Um, I'm I'm just wondering if you want to open open it out and what the practice of meditation sheds light on that we are not our thoughts. Well, I don't think I ever took much comfort from those sort of 
Statements film. <clears throat> For me, the greatest comfort I think throughout my life has just been that of going outside. Getting out into nature. It's when I listen to other people telling me how much somebody's words or a certain book has helped them, uh, I often think, well, this is rather strange. It, I, I, it hasn't often been like that for me. I think perhaps being primarily an emotional man, I, you know, the sort of logic of what somebody else may say, I'm not my thoughts, has, has, has always sort of rather been pushed aside by the waves of my despair. Or my, <laughs> or on the other hand, my, my, uh, my good feelings. So I've always been one to follow the heart, really, rather than the reason. But the heart, uh, or love, as they say, can be blind, very blind. Perhaps I've acquired a bit more reason as I've, go, as I've grown older. Well, we have to turn for whatever help works for us, and we all are different in this way. Mm. I wouldn't like to prescribe anything. Um, some a lot of people it's other it, for a lot of people it, it is other people their friends um, or their dog dogs <laughs> even sport all sorts of things people find help them yes meditation has always helped me. The reassurance that something's bigger than me, I think, yes, that sense of space. That sense you're turning to something wiser. Something bigger and wiser than me. Quite soon in meditation, I, I began to think of meditation really as a journey of love, a journey of my love to the greater love. And that, of course, was the greatest of comfort to me because the great cry of my heart has always been throughout my life to love and be loved. And, uh, and nearly all human experience somehow is, isn't really big enough, I suppose, I found. There always seem to be some condition to it. But that again took me quite a number of years really to, to discover a fuller measure of that. It doesn't happen immediately. I don't want to be uh, too prescriptive for others. I don't know what other people's situation is, but one of the things that uh, I, I've benefited from in my meditation practice is um, a, a sense of everything um, everything comes and goes everything that comes goes um, it passes um, and I personally find this very helpful that um, I have a melancholy temperament mm. so it takes me a lot to kick start into the day actually and just the simple observation that uh, whatever mood it is, I, I know that it will pass. And of course that's uh, far too glib for somebody who's uh, suffering from um, long-term depression. Um, but um, it is one of the um, prescriptions in uh, Matt Haig's book. It's interesting that... Uh, uh, a Sunday Times bestseller book is on mental health uh, by uh, Reasons to Stay Alive. And one of his top ten um, uh, 
uh, uh, recommendations is to have this um, open-ended uh, attitude that uh, this too will pass. It's often much easier to say that about things outside oneself, isn't it? The weather and other people's depression. But when it's one's own, the, the curtains seem to close around one, doesn't it? And within those curtains, even the most reasonable st statements about life, it will pass. Sometimes just don't have room, just don't have a place. We can get very small, very tight and very dark. It's interesting this despair, the statistics you quote are mostly when we're young, aren't they? 21 to 25, perhaps after after that we this experience that all things pass gradually comes into balance the totally egocentric thinking of youth i have to put a shed some light on that from from the um, statistics that i've looked up um, for this conversation and i i can only refer to the uk um, th this comes from the Samaritans uh, uh, and refers only to UK men. Um, it's uh, m more than three times as many men as women can um, take their own life. And um, the, the most at risk age group amongst men is 45 to 49. So that's, that's, that's the, the da dangerous zone. The, with, with, with young men, 19 to 25, um, uh, it, it's, it's a lower rate, but it's the most common cause of young men's death. Well, I was 45 when I had an experience that tipped me into the Well, it was so much a greater in depression than anything I'd known before that it was. It was some years I wandered around in a no man's land, completely lost, utter despair. Forty-five, yes, is sometimes called the midlife crisis, isn't it? Yeah. This one sort of. I suppose it marks a time between you pass, when you feel you pass your prime, at least as a physical man. Begin to feel you're beginning to decline. Yes, I know about that one. How did I get through it? Well, God knows. I don't think I did. My mother also went through a long period of depression. About that, about that age, a bit older, it went on for a long time. She took various pills and various doctors tried to help her and nothing really worked. Poor dad struggled with it. And then she likes to tell how one morning she woke up and it was gone. I suppose something like that happened to me. I, after some years of completely lost, I was I was offered a opportunity to go back to to university and study Russian, and I got interested in that, and I just forgot. I think about depression. I don't, think any, I don't think anybody's advice helped me at all. You know, they say time heals, don't they? I guess that's true. You ask me, what can one do? I 
don't think I have an answer. Keep plodding on. In a way, life itself <coughs> sort of pulls us out of bed in the morning, doesn't it, and compels us to eat. Somehow one gets through the day. <laughs> we don't quite know how, but somehow just the machinery of life pulls us along, doesn't it? Often we don't know, we look back and say, God knows how I survived. God knows how I got through. God knows how I managed. Having said that, John, you you did go through it. You, you experienced the depths of it. And as you say, there was, there was perhaps nothing that anybody could say that helped you through it other, other than you went back to university, are you? To study Russian. Now on the other side uh, of depression, um, what can you say is the not the antidote? Um, I, I, I think I don't think there is one. But what is the truth of the situation uh, when when we're enclosed, as you say, behind the curtain of the closed dark room? But what is the truth of the situation? Well, that's easier stuff to answer because about, yes, the truth is, you see, as I've often tried to convey in this, in these videos, is that, is that if we uh, open our attention, which of course is the very opposite of being closed in like that, if we just open up and feel, as I've said a million times, feet on the floor, bottom on the chair, listen and look. You see what happens? Immediately, this me and my problem open up, aren't they? And to a greater or lesser degree, we feel the peace that actually pervades everything. There are the motor cars on the road, people in the church, and there is this space we sit in. Now I realise that I've been practising this for many, many years, and it's it's sort of easy as pie to me now. <laughs> but to some people it isn't. But even just that sense of ah, just that suddenly. Besides me and my problems, there's the church clock. There's a sort of another, another something else in the situation. And you're, well, there's another person. You're actually sitting there. I'm not the only <laughs> person in the world. <laughs> but, you know, the picture is immediately expanded, isn't it? And truth. And, of course, these shadows that you see, there's like motor cars on the road. They come to pass, don't they? You get an idea that here is this transitory world in which we are sitting, functioning, and it takes place within this context of what doesn't change, which is the space that fills this church and outside, and is in fact all containing, contains the whole world within this unchangeability, infinite, unchanging, unshakable. Well, what is truth? I like the definition, it's what doesn't change. And here we are, we have this unchanging. Is it separate from me? Well, where do I end and it begin? Isn't it? Well, what is it that's speaking my words? The energy? What's this? It's the energy behind the energy behind the energy that we can identify. The depth behind the depth behind the depth. This infinite potential. Which we can call various names, but is actually nameless, indescribable. 
Atma, the I am, what's actually there when all the extras <laughs> are let go. Well, maybe that's the truth. And of course, once one begins to connect with that, this uh, pitiful, pitiful little uh, worm in a hole It's very small indeed, isn't it? Could you say, John, it, uh, we're all under a sense of mistaken identity? Absolutely we are. Yes, this is, the, this is exactly the human condition. We are... Um, not only mistaken, but we're actually lost in this mistaken identity lost in uh, what we discovered to be separate. Lost sheep, in other words. That's exactly what we are. That is the human condition. And therefore, because we are lost, we're away from home, that is why we die, that is mortality, that is why we are ill at ease. We get disease, this is the cause of all problems and all sickness and all misfortune. It's simply because we're not where we belong. We're not at home in the infinite providence, which is our natural home. In other words, our heavenly home. We've fallen down from it um, into this world of darkness fallen from the light, you see, as I demonstrate, into darkness. And hence arise all human misfortunes. And if we go and if we, if we try to treat darkness with darkness, what happens is just, you know, the more hospitals you build, the more sick people you get to put into them. Ultimately, the the only answer to human darkness is to turn to the light. And then if we're fortunate enough to get a glimpse of the light, to be, as it were, a candle in this world of darkness, and share that light with others. <laughs>